I know I'm a bit late to be ranking Elden Ring's regions, but you know what? So is FromSoft on releasing that DLC, so I think that makes it okay. But really, I always struggled on deciding how I felt about each region, so I could not have done this video on the first few months of the game's release. And by regions, I of course mean big zones like Limgrave, Aldous Plateau, Kaelid, etc. Anyway, let's begin from the bat tier onwards. Mountain tops of the giants makes me want to kill myself. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but out of all the regions in Elden Ring, I think this is the only one that actively makes the game worse. It's not just disappointing as its own region, but it lessens other zones that came before it as well. Mountain Tops is just way too fucking big for its own good, and yet despite being so big, it's really linear. You'll start out at the Forbidden Lands, go straight through a narrow path to the left of Rold, then up to Zamo Ruins, cross the big chain, into a valley, into a frozen lake, then across another chain, and finally into a mountain filled with Kaelid enemies. The only time you can diverge from the main paths around the valley, where you can go up and explore another graveyard location, with one of the most annoying bosses in the game waiting for you, the Death Ride Shitbird. Or cross a bridge to fight the greatest gank boss since Ornstein and Smo, Dragon Slayer Earth Tree Avatar, and Executioner Earth Tree Avatar. And speaking of which, I'm still working on that Top 10 Earth Tree Avatars video. It's just taking a lot of effort, you know, it's a big project. The valley is still the best part of the whole zone though, since it actually takes advantage of being an open world. The highlight of it is definitely Castle Sol, which you may or may not hate for its ghostly knights, but it has a better lot than Zolin, not that that's a big accomplishment, and Commander Neil, an actual chat boss, very underrated if you ask me. But other than that, 90% of mountaintops is like a linear level super stretched out, for no good reason considering the lack of new content. The only new enemy in this entire zone as far as I can tell is the fire prelate with a whip. Cool enemy for sure, but it's not even an enemy type, but a single enemy, at a single point in the zone. That's just not enough, for the rest of it you're up against enemies that have much overstayed their welcome. Demi-humans, bats, golems, way too many golems, crayfish, trolls, giant hands that feel very out of place, and most egregiously in my opinion, Kaelid's T-Rex dogs and crows. These are very distinct, unique enemies that felt really at home in the nasty, corrupt environment of Kaelid. Considering all the scarlet rot and poison I thought maybe they used to be normal crows and dogs, but all the toxins caused them to mutate. They don't seem like very natural beings, you know, especially the dogs. But Mountain Tops dispels all that. That's just what they are, I guess. They're not native to Kaelid or anything. That last section before Fire Giant is absolutely atrocious. It's easy to ride past with a horse and completely pointless to interact with any of the enemies there. They're always in groups and have a trillion health points. What is the point of enemies if you don't ever fight them? Just scenery? Personally, I think they should have put more emphasis on the Fire Monk faction. They're a very cool group of enemies that you rarely fight, and their red attire and flames contrast nicely with the zone. But besides the chain overlook, they're only present in this little linear camp that feels unfinished. Feels like it's supposed to have a proper castle, but it's not really even that. Just walls. As for the caves and catacombs, I don't want to talk too much about them when I talk about the regions, because they feel very separate from them, most of the time. But I will say that two of them are kinda decent. One cave has neat fluorescent colors and a fun snail summoner gimmick, and another is kind of puzzle focused, where you need to find a light source to make enemies vulnerable. But unfortunately all the bosses found in the dungeons and caves are nothing but overly familiar opponents that should have retired by now. So all in all, despite its geographical location, Mountaintops of the Giants is far from the game's peak. But you know what is peak? That's right, it's today's video sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. If you're like me and you're into RPGs with tons of bosses, loot and customization, with beautiful fantasy art style in the backdrop, you might just be in luck. So join the 400 million players worldwide and choose from, not 10, not 20, but over 700 champions from 15 different factions. Pretty much any itch you have for fantasy creatures will be scratched. Whether that's powerful archmages, elves of any flavor, lizard men who are way cooler than they have any right to be, or my favorites, skinwalkers. There's 12 dungeons currently, all containing a boss and loot, making it worth the venture, regardless if you're there for the challenge or the reward. If you're more of a PvP guy, there's tons to do there as well, in Classic, Tag Team and the freshly arrived Live Arena. And the best part is that the game gets regular content and quality of life updates, so it's no wonder the game's been going strong for over 4 years now. One such update has just been released, which has brought us a fearsome new boss, Akumori, the Phantom Shogun. This undead general is guarding everything you need for Accessory Ascension, a new feature that allows you to upgrade your gear to even greater heights. 
Also, if you've somehow managed to miss out on the incredible animated limited series, Raid Call of the Arbiter, then you can check out all the 10 episodes on the official Raid Shadow Legends YouTube channel right now. So with all this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you haven't already, now's the perfect time to try it out. It's completely free to download on mobile and desktop. Use my link in the description or use the QR code to get some pretty sweet bonuses. You've got nothing to lose, so go 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 go! To me, mountaintops of the giants reminds me about the parts of winter I hate. It's cold, dark, depressing, while consecrated snowfield is the part I love about winter. It's pure white everywhere, snowflakes are falling on your face, biting in a sweet way, the feeling and sound of walking on fresh snow, getting pummeled by giant bears. So peaceful and tranquil, but for most, all consecrated snowfield reminds them of is frigid outskirts. I mean, I can see where they got the comparison from with the blinding blizzard and vast field of nothing but snow. But A, you have a horse to ride on to make traversal speedier. B, you don't have those reindeer fuckers spawning everywhere. C, you can follow the little glowing, I don't know, candles, rocks. Plus you have a map and a compass, so it's not a complete shot in the dark as to where you're headed. My main reason for somewhat enjoying this place is just the ambience. It is so isolated, cut off from the rest of the world, you can barely even see the earth tree from here. There are literally zero NPCs in the entire place. Not to mention it being a secret area that you have to find two items to even get to. All this makes it feel serene and undisturbed. There is beauty in that isolation. I'm a fan of this place's aesthetics. The branchless pointy trees, red flowers, constant snowing, and I think the background ambience music really does it justice. The caves here are also more noteworthy to me than the ones found in mountaintops. I mean, look at this place, it's got see-through ice, a dragon corpse, and a misbegotten crusader that somehow got his hands on the Sword of Radigan. But you know what, I'm glad he did, because it's a fun boss. You don't get too many of those in these late-game dungeons. And unlike mountaintops, I can confidently say this place has its own dedicated enemy group. Unfortunately, said group is kinda horrible. They're stationary archers with unreasonable amount of health, who just spam one attack over and over again, even when you're up close. They have no melee attacks unless they're riding on wolves, in which case they're a little bit better. Mainly they're found surrounding ordinary, literal torture town. This is the centerpiece structure of the entire zone, and it's pretty awful. The gimmick of lighting the candles to open the way forward is fine and all, just a shame they picked the worst combination of enemies imaginable as obstacles. Those stationary archers and invisible enemies. Fuck me! And at the end of the day, Consecrated Snowfield is just a flat open field with sparse content. And most of that content is stuff you've already done before. But if you're like me, at least you'll enjoy strolling through it on your way to Morg or Melania, even if it's mostly for the ambience. I've seen a lot of people rank Mount Gelmir on the higher end of their lists, but it's just never quite done it for me personally. It has fun exploration, but one that's never really rewarding. There's a lot of climbing and rugged terrain involved, and in concept that's great, but I wish they went about it in a different way than having one insanely long ladder climb after another, after another, after another, during which all you can see is the cliff you're facing, or your character's titties. And you might say, duh, idiot, how else are you gonna climb a mountain? Well, how about those spirit springs? Clearly they can do that since the highest peak of the area is reached using one. Why not use it more? That would be fun, quick and efficient. Maybe it's to give the game time to load assets, but regardless of the reason, it doesn't make for the most fun gameplay for me. It just feels like a waste of time. Aesthetically, some will say Mount Gelmir is either the coolest or the ugliest. Personally, I don't love the color palette that much, but the overall design of the mountain is really cool. Feels like there's no empty spaces with nothing in them. There's always something to look at. The verticality definitely helps creating a sense of scale. Compared to other regions, Mount Gelmir is structured in a pretty unique way. It's not one big open sandbox field, it's more like multiple linear paths on different stages of the mountain. There's an eruption-filled path at the bottom that leads you on a long trip through a Phaimon garrison, lava, a demi-human town with a headless abductor virgin, before looping back to the main path. Other than that, the only notable side path is before Volcano Manor, but all that leads to is a cuntback worm face fucker, and then an ulcerated tree spirit. If this area had more unique enemies, I think the journey would feel more worth taking slowly. But I can give them some credit for equipping many of the existing enemies with things like lava pots and madness. But it's still not the same as holy new foes. Demi humans just don't do it for me anymore, they should have stayed in the starter zones. They're an absolute non threat. But my favorite encounter here is definitely the full grown falling star beast on the way to Volcano Manor. And speaking of which, as great as Volcano Manor is, the quality of the legacy dungeons found inside the regions won't affect my ranking, but the way they're incorporated into them does. In Mount Gelmir, it's done in a decent enough way. I like how it's mostly hidden and secluded, making it lore appropriate. Other than that, it doesn't have much influence over the area. 
Not much to say about the dungeons, except I like whenever they incorporate lava into them. But the bosses are just never worth the time. But despite my lack of enthusiasm for Mount Gelmir, it doesn't make the game worse in any way. I don't mind it existing as a little side path. It takes a bit too long on the ladders, but, you know, it doesn't ruin Kaelid's enemies or fuck up the pacing of the entire second half of the game. So, it's okay. Everything positive I have to say about a Weeping Peninsula would have to be followed by the words, at the time. It was exciting finding a whole other region south of Lindgrave, at the time. The Misbegottens were an interesting new enemy faction, at the time. Seeing walking mausoleums was quite the spectacle to see, at the time. Castle Morden looked awesome and imposing as hell, at the time. Leonine Misbegotten felt like a worthy opponent to have at the climax of the whole region, at the time. The caves were kinda shit even at the time though, not gonna lie. Let's see what bosses we have here. A bear? A scaly misbegotten? A plant? Seriously, a plant! These aren't bosses, these are just regular enemies, what the fuck? But the reason Weeping Peninsula's best aspects have aged like the corpses in my basement is because everything here gets invalidated by the rest of the game. Misbegotten's and even their leader, Leonine Misbegotten, aren't special to Weeping Peninsula. They're everywhere. Leonine is especially disappointing because he had such a fun moveset, but all along he was a standard enemy, or seen in other gang fights. Lovely. Castle Morn has its charm, but what is there besides enemies I can find plenty elsewhere? Not like the aesthetics will be missed, there's other castles with the same assets in other zones. What does Weeping Peninsula have to offer that won't be found anywhere else? Other than unique loot? Nothing. It even looks practically the same as Lingrave, except it rains more often. But all those things were good at the time, and that's not nothing. I like the overall layout of everything, it's densely packed with things to do and find, and I have some fond memories of everything I experienced for the first time here. It's ripe with upgrade material, so I still keep coming back here every playthrough, but every time I do, I wonder, why does this region even exist? You could delete this entire zone and the game wouldn't change. It was a B tier area the first time around, a D tier on subsequent playthroughs, so it evens out as a C. It's a decent region. Kaled is such a mixture of absolute peak Elden Ring and absolute bottom trash. But what sticks out the most the moment you step in is just how insanely different everything feels and looks. It's like an alien planet with all the giant mold balls, mushrooms, dead trees, oversized plants and all the red everywhere. It's incredible. Everything around Swamp of Aeonia is 10 out of 10 visually. The swamp itself is kinda meh, but at least you can avoid the Scarlet Rot by just riding on your horse. Until Millicent invades you and forces you to dismount in the middle of poison and clean rock nights. What a cunt! But not only are the aesthetics of Kaled bizarre, but the enemies are even more so. The first time I saw one of those giant crows perked up on a tree, I just froze for a minute. There's something more scary about them just sitting there than outright attacking you that creeps me out. And of course the dinosaur dogs are equally as memorable, and I really love fighting them. Hitting their heads is incredibly satisfying, and I appreciate that they do friendly damage to one another, making it easier to handle groups. Along with them, there's kindreds of rot, mushroom people, and hordes of zombies that complement the environment beautifully. Or nastily, I guess. Everything along the way to Redmain Castle is brilliant, minus the decaying dragon. But as for everything outside of that path, well, there's Grail's Dragon Barrow. Not gonna lie, if I were to count Dragon Barrow separately, it would be a tier below Mountaintops of the Giants. This place is absolutely worthless. It's just a stripped down version of Kaled without any of the intrigue, only the most boring dragons and constant rain. How do you manage to make dragons boring? They're the coolest fantasy creatures to exist and you make them a complete snooze fest. I really don't see any reason for this place to exist and I don't really want to talk about it. Fuck it. As for the dungeons, there's one I really like. Jail Cave. It's an underground prison labyrinth where in order to progress you have to release all the prisoners and backtrack through them and it ends up taking you back all the way to Limgrave. That's neat. Unfortunately, every other dungeon kinda sucks. There's one uniting theme for most of them. Scarlet Rot. This is how they decided to distinguish Kaled's dungeons from the other regions. By just having Scarlet Rot all over the floors. What a fantastic fucking idea! Another common complaint about Kaled is the lack of notable landmarks. There's no legacy dungeons. Redmain Castle is cool and all, but it's just a repainted Castle Morn. Celia feels underwhelming for how lore significant it is. Fort Gale is alright, but there's not much there. But simply for the atmosphere of this place and the fun gameplay to be had along the road to Redmain Castle, it's gotta be a great tier region. You can't convince me otherwise. Just ignore everything outside of that main path.
probably a surprising placement considering Altus Plateau being the fan favorite along with Lingrave, but I wasn't that big into exploring this place the first time around. It was starting to feel too samey, like the game had plateaued. I knew what to expect with the ruins, minor earth trees, caravans and caves. It was beginning to feel less like exploration and more like a checklist, but that doesn't mean any of the content is bad. There's a good handful of new enemies to be found, like worm faces, who I'd rather have stayed unfound, perfumers, and the midsummer cultists in the windmill village, which is a great little side area. Visually speaking, Aldous Plateau is a great departure from previous areas, but gameplay-wise, it's more of the same, but a little bit better. But because it is more of the same, it feels less special. There's nothing particularly bad or exciting about the new dungeons and field bosses. Lancex was a tad disappointing though. She welcomes you to the area, then fucks up before the fight even begins properly, and I assumed she would be found later in the game as a major boss. But no, she just relocated somewhere else in Aldous Plateau where you can kill her for good, and she doesn't even have a face too. Not to mention she doesn't differ at all from the many ancient dragons found in Faramazula. What to me is the saving grace though is how excellent the main path in Aldous Plateau is. You get to infiltrate a heavily guarded gate and fight two tree sentinels back to back. And there's decently fun side activities around the gate as well. Then should you press forward you'll face a giant gargoyle who I swear is a harder boss than the actual main boss of this region, Morgoth. And the gargoyle isn't even a boss. Then you move on to a cool looking battle strewn field and fight Margit again. Some will call it lazy, I would call it fun because I like fighting Margit and his presence makes enough sense. Then on your way to the city you dodge giant arrows from golems, fight the draconic sentinel and absolute giga chat and a fun as fuck fight. And of course there's the city itself which cannot not be mentioned because its presence is felt everywhere. It's beautifully integrated to the zone. So I think Aldous Plateau is great for replays as it doesn't waste your time and just gives you the good stuff back to back in quick succession. But it's not exactly an explorer's wet dream. Lernia of the Lakes is by far the prettiest area in the game for me. No matter where I am, I just can't help but stop and look around at the scenery every once in a while. While the giant lake in the middle itself could be better as it is just a flat white land, it does wonders for the region's visuals. First time coming here was a truly magical experience. Coming off from Stormvale, I couldn't wait for the next major castle, which would tease me all throughout my stay in Lernia. Even though I think Rhea Lucaria itself is a little lacking, its placement in the region is fantastic and it's eye candy every time I turn around to look at it. Which I can do anywhere because no matter where you go, you can see its majesty towering above the wetlands. Unlike most regions, here I wound up encountering more new enemies than old. Wraith Collis crawling in the water, giant crayfish going cray cray, Albinorix doing cartwheels all over the place, fucking love these dudes, marionette soldiers spinning around, and all manner of things in Korea Manor. And I'm barely scratching the surface here. I don't have much to complain about the dungeons of Lernia, most of them are fine. I like ruined strewn precipice and how it's partially outdoors, plus it's a nice transition to Aldous Plateau. The crystal cave is fun to traverse, Rhea Lucaria mines was a neat upgrade from the previous mines, and all in all I love the region-wide magic theme. This place has just so much good content in it, so many points of interest, things I remember fondly for finding the first time, amazing enemy variety. So why is Lernia in great tier and not amazing? Well. I think Lernia is simply too big. It takes about 10 minutes of horse riding to reach from one end to the other, and it's not a particularly exciting trip to make. Sure you can use the teleporters to skip some of it, but that's besides the point. Why is there so much space? There's a lot of content overall, but it doesn't need to be this spread out. I would unironically cut Lernia in, at the very least, half. It tracks down replay value for this game a lot. For me anyway. Yet, I can't not have a great amount of fondness for it for how much enjoyment I got out of exploring it. Limgrave obviously has the advantage of being the first region, but let's not ignore the fact that it's a perfectly designed intro area. While you are free to go wherever you want, the game does heavily suggest you to follow the trail shown by Grace, which is a path that teaches you many of the essentials. You'll see there are field bosses you can fight in the open world, or ignore. Kale gives you the crafting kit, then on your way to the gatefront you'll have a more open area where you can find a cave, some scarabs and loot. Then you get to gatefront, which is really like the first proper enemy camp you'll end up clearing most likely. It was kind of a significant challenge at the beginning of the game and the Spear Knight feels like half a boss. Should you continue the guided path, there's one set piece after another. A troll jumps down to ambush you while crossbow soldiers are sniping you, wolves falling from the sky somehow, a gate leading to Stormvale that's guarded by a ballista and a bunch of soldiers, and then Margit. The main path is just so damn tight. And if you've been a good boy so far and just followed the path, you'll probably hit a brick wall in Margit. 
but the brilliance of Margit is that he'll probably make you go back and explore more of Limgrave so you can come back better equipped. And there's a lot to explore. Every cave feels worth doing, every boss is new and exciting, all the loot you can find is meaningful, every jails were awesome, until they no longer were in late game. Thanks Goat Froy! But I mean, Crucible Knight in such an early area was no joke and I remember that fight so fondly. You'll see your own progress by how you'll start faring better and better against bosses you couldn't defeat before, and it's a great feeling. And what's even better is that they remain appropriately challenging for replays. Nowadays I always fight Tree Sentinel and Margit as soon as I can, and it's fun. So Limgrave has a brilliant main path like Aldous and Kaelid, but is also as much fun to explore as Lurnia, without being too stretched out. Not to mention you can find the Shearfer River from here. And hey, speaking of which... Alright, so this might be a surprising inclusion, let alone winner, but if you combine all three major underground areas, Shiver River, Einsel River and Deep Root Deaths, I think they together create the best region in the game. And you know what? Combine them is what I did, though I would happily leave Lake of Rot outside of it. So some sections allow horse riding, others don't, there are no dungeons and caves really, or most of your usual open world stuff. But when it comes to exploration, this is Elden Ring's strongest case of it. Finding each of these three locations felt really special and shocking. I didn't think that on top of the large outside world there would be even more underneath it. And with the exception of Deep Root Depths, they all felt like a real breath of fresh air. Ironically, I guess, since we're not even technically outside. The enemies were new and fun to fight, the aesthetic stood out as unique, and in Shiver River's case, absolutely gorgeous. And you're given a reason to explore all of it with the objective of lighting all the braziers to unlock a boss. While you're looking for them around the ancestral woods, you might notice how fun the traversal here is. There's lots of climbing and platforming you can do to find special loot and hidden areas. Einsel River never allows you to ride a horse, but focuses more on creating an oppressive atmosphere, with successful results. Those ant tunnels make my skin crawl. Both this and Shiver River also have so-called sleeping cities, as if there wasn't enough exciting stuff to discover. Then there's... deep root depths. It exists. Really, there's so much to talk about regarding all the major and minor areas within each river, I don't think I can do it all justice in this one video, so if you want to hear more of my thoughts in detail, I did cover every single underground location in my area ranking series. But going forward, I'm hoping FromSoft will do more of this sort of semi-open world design, rather than super massive landscapes. You can still keep the horse riding without losing that tight level design we've all come to know and love. But that's about it for this video. Let me know what you think, and don't forget to use my Raid Shadow Legends link in the description or scan the QR code to get those new player bonuses. Alright, see ya.